Good morning, friends. It is Lisa Mason Ziegler coming to you here from the Gardener's Workshop and glad you guys are um, that we're going to be able to do this here together because um, it's just it's a beautiful day outside. However, it is still pretty wet here. So I am tempted to go out there and work in my garden, but you should never work when the soil is wet not even walking on it in my opinion, because it compresses it like will never be undone. Anyway, so welcome to Seed Starting Saturday. And today we have some good stuff to do. We're gonna do our weekly sunflowers, as well as I am gonna do a little help for Bobo. We are kind of heading into high seed starting season here on the farm for cool flowers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm going to do a couple of trays for her of we are just at the very beginning of our cool flower seed starting and we start out with those um, cool season hardy annuals that are kind of slow growers um, and it's a big family that we grow and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So friends, just a lot to bring you up to date on. First off, before I go through my little list of things that I want to be sure that um, if y'all don't miss out on. Friends, August is the month that takes farmers out. Home gardeners just decide not to go outside. And that's okay. Then you just kind of have a mess to go to when you finally do re-emerge. Um, we're tired. Most often, folks have not taken steps to prevent weeds and to have crops coming on. And um, August is the month that just really, my dog is eating something, y'all. What are you eating? Oh, he's eating Gumphrina, a big old stem of it. Good for him. <laughs> um, and so all I want to say is I am tired. It's it's a natural month for everybody to be tired. You know, it's August. It's like what for us, it's like the fourth or the fifth month of being in high gear um, as a grower, you know, planting and harvesting. It's the harvesting that takes us out, right? I mean, holy cow. Um, and so I want to just say, if you have flower farm and friends, you might want to check in on them. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that and um, I totally get it. I am also weary, even though we are not um, in high production anymore, we are in high production of lots of other projects um, that are creating about the same workload. So um, and I just want to say, August, if you're feeling defeated, um, overcome, knee deep, like you'll never, ever, ever catch up, you are not alone, friends. And sometimes commiserating with people that are suffering like you are make it better. So just hang on, you know, October and pumpkin spice is just around the corner, which I am not a fan of that, but it makes people feel warm and fuzzy. Um, and that's what cool flowers is to the gardening world and the farming world. It is the hope of spring and it's the fresh start. And I just encourage everybody to like, if you're going to not do what you're supposed to be doing outside, at least learn what you should be doing um, when you finally re-emerge. Um, so I want to highlight a couple of things. Um, first off, if you are watching me here on YouTube, it helps me so much if you would subscribe and like this um, broadcast. That helps YouTube to show me to more people, right? And if you're watching me on Facebook, if you would like and share this, particularly to share this in any group you're a member of that you think it might be helpful, um, that helps me so much. Again, Facebook and YouTube will engage more people for us when they know that people like what you're seeing. So that just really, really helps me. So we just kind of launched a new um, series on the podcast and it's called Seed Talk and it's Cool Flower Seed Talk right now. And it's myself and my seed manager, Lane, um, <clears throat> who is quite an avid gardener and um, she is the one that fields all the questions that come into the 
um, to the website and to the office and through our social media platforms. And so she's kind of like taking those questions and she's presenting them to me. And we're talking about a lot of different stuff. In addition to the podcast, she's made a slideshow to go with it. And you'll find that here on YouTube, if that's where you're watching, it went live this morning. And um, we've got some more of those planned. So hopefully that'll help some of you guys. So keep your eye out for those. And you can also just listen to it on your regular podcast app, like you listen to everything else. And the other things, friends, is our Friday live show inside the Gardener's Workshop app is exploding. Um, you can now, if you don't want to put an app on your phone, which is the best way to interact with it, the next best way is you can actually go to our website, go to the shop, and a little menu will drop down. And the very top menu selection is the live show, live shop and show or live shop. I'm not sure what it says. Tap there, and that brings up a page where you can watch replays. If the show happened to be live when you did that, you could watch it there and interact. Um, and you can also download the apps there. And um, we have tons of fun. We give away something awesome every week. We have special bundles, introduce new products. See this coxcomb right here? It's a, We're not um, sharing what the name of it is yet because we haven't um, completely add, got it on board. Um, they voted Friday to definitely add that to our lineup. You know, it's, a, it's just a really fun thing. And we broadcast it here from the farm. And this is one portion of the harvest. I'm going to bend aside so you can see it. This is just part of it. You want to guess where the rest of it is? I'm going to move this. We hung it all up. We're drying it. That is the rest of that harvest hanging up there. And on that show, what happens is I'm going through showing the flowers from our harvest and giving you additional information and um, just giving you some pertinent info that you can't really find. So thank you so much for joining us over there. And if you want to be in the know about all this stuff, all you have to do is go to thegardenersworkshop.com and sign up for our news, our once a week farm news, which is like a headliner page. Um, we would love for you to do that. So today, let's get down to business. I am actually going to be sowing one tray of sunflowers and I'm actually going to be doing the pro cut mix, which is all 12 or 13 of the varieties in there together. Um, and then I'm going to be sowing some soil blocks of Rudbeckia, which is what we have already started to start um, because Rudbeckias um, are that um, cool flower that is just a really super slow grower. I see that we are live over there. Let me, y'all, I've kind of boxed myself in here. So let's do the sunflowers first and get them done because they're kind of quick and easy, right? So, you know, I'm always, you have to ID your, your tray. So we start sunflowers every week. Um, we stick with at least one variety in the same color family so that we don't get off our timetable. Um, and so Pro Cut Mix has all the colors in it. And if I planted that every single week, we would have sunflowers every single week. If I cut it pro, if I planted Pro Cut Orange or the Fall Medley, um, we make several of these mixes in house, and you can find them over on our website if you want to check them out. So we use um, this is the garden marker that I've used for years, literally like almost two decades. This brand of marker. Um, and you can find it available on our website. What is today? Today is, I got to turn around and look, y'all. 813, and that kind of freaked Tucker out, who was asleep at my feet. And so this is Pro Cut Mix. And so the, the really important thing, if you are a flower farmer and you're not sowing sunflowers weekly, you are missing a huge opportunity. If you're a home gardener and you want to just have sunflowers each week or so, you wouldn't have to do it every week. You could probably do it every couple of weeks and that would probably work. Um, but if you're a grower, you've got to sow every single week. We do pro, pro cuts or I'm kind of a big fan of pro cuts because they're quick from seed to bloom. And um, it's from seed to bloom is like 55 to 60 days. So I'm just going to pour these out in my hand. And I'm going to turn you down so you can actually see what I'm doing. So this is a cell tray. It's a 128. That means there's 128 little holes here. 
the mix that's in here is just 50% of any potting soil. It does not have to be seed starting mix and 50% finished compost. We typically just buy a bag of compost um, and a potting mix and then Bobo mixes them together in a large tub. And that large tub is where I drop this tray and just scoop the soil up on and fill it. And that way you don't have to worry about wasting any because it's inside the big tub of where the soil is. You can clean the top off really well. Um, you know, soil is pretty expensive. Um, and so you wanna just be sure that you're not leaving a lot of excess on your tray because it'll just get washed away when you actually go and water your tray. Um, I learned that the hard way because we do this in a grow room with a drain in the floor and there would be so much dirt on the floor and it's like, oh my gosh, we have to clean those trays better, right? Um, so I'm just dropping a seed on the top of each cell. And so back in May, when those seeds would have been blooming in the height of summer, like in late June and in July, Sometimes I would put two to three seeds in a cell and never thin them and plant them out on the very same spacing because when the days are super long, like they are in June and July, the flowers that are growing out in the garden, um, those flower heads can get much bigger just because of the day length. They get more sun, more growing time in, right? Um, but that's not necessary this time of the year because we're already heading into shorter days, right? And that'll keep your blooms. Y'all can't see what I'm doing, can you? Um, that'll keep your blooms the size we want. And the size we want for cut flowers is three to four inches. That is the perfect size to make bouquets. Your commercial customers will love that size. Um, I had to really introduce and train my florist. Now they can't stand those big ooky ones they get from the wholesaler. I, I really got them hooked. Took me a while to get them on board, but once I did, it was an ongoing challenge to keep up with our sunflower production. All right, so let me, now, so sunflowers are done. Y'all, you think I'd be much more organized, but I'm not. All right, so now I'm just putting my finger on the seed and pushing it down in there. Now, if you have 60 days or more before your first expected frost, you still have time to plant pro cuts. And in fact, I plant, I continue to plant seeds, start seeds um, about 40 days, 45 days before my last frost, because you can't always count on your frost coming on time. And sunflowers are more cold tolerant than we think. Um, and if you are going to have like a really harsh cold night and then it looks good after that night, you better believe I'd throw a little row cover over your transplants out in the garden to get them protected. To have sunflowers for Thanksgiving, friends, is a huge opportunity. All right. So I just smashed them all in, right? So sunflower seeds germinate best when they are covered. So we just pushed them down in the tray. And if you were to look in the cell right now, some of the sunflowers you can still see. However, when I take this into the grow room and water it in, I use a watering can with a sprinkler head and water this tray really well. Water it once, then water it all over again. I'm a double dipper. That is the way to be sure your stuff is watered properly. And that will wash the soil that's on the walls of the cell down on top of the seeds. So they will then be popped onto a seedling heat mat. And can y'all hear there's construction going on outside, literally outside that door right there. Um, they're scraping gravel now. Um, and so I will pop this watered tray up onto a seedling heat mat. And then once 50 percent or more of the seeds, you see them, the seed cracking and that neck starting to come out. That's when you would either move them either to, coming back y'all, um, you would either move that to grow lights, but most of us just move them directly outdoors into full blast and sun because it's summer and it's hot enough out there. Um, for full blast and sun, but you do, do probably, like I do, have to protect them for varmints, um, ra um, rabbits, 
squirrels and the birds are the worst. They'll come peck the top off of every transplant. I have trays out there right now. Um, so you got to think about that, right? So you can also post your questions and I will circle back to those when we get to the end. Um, so the rest of the sunflower series and each week I talk about this if you need more details. But once we move them outside and they're two to three weeks old, when they're about this tall and when you pull on the stem, the entire cell of soil just easily comes out. You don't feel like you're ripping the stem off of the roots. If you're not getting good, strong roots, then that means that heat at the very initial sprouting time, um, you need to change something. That's why I like to use a heat mat. Um, it gets that seed to sprout quick and see and roots to just grow. We then plant them out into the garden into prepared soil that has been prepared with the dry organic fertilizer. Um, we incorporate that into the bed. Then we plant this transplant five rows in a 30 inch wide bed and then six inches apart in the row. We do not use the Bio360 film, nor do we use flower support netting. If you're a small grower, I would recommend both of those. But when you're in high production doing thousands a week, week after week, you obviously can't do that. And you just take a calculated risk that you're going to lose them to a storm um, if you don't net them. Um, but we feel like when we plant our transplants, they're already a third of the way through their life and they don't really need that much weed intervention. Um, and then we basically cut them when they're, you know, 55 to 60 days after the seed was started. So they only have like 30 or so days after we plant them in the garden and you harvest. And if you do that week after week after week after week, you have sunflowers every single week to puff up your bouquets, to sell to commercial customers, whatever it is that your charge is. So I wanted to, um, I'm trying to help out Bobo. We just have a lot going on here on the farm. And when I say a lot, I mean, if I stop and think about it all, you might need to check me in somewhere. Um, so Bobo is part of that with me. And so I am trying to like help her carve away at our enormous seed starting calendar. So we are just now, so we're not starting any more warm season stuff except sunflowers squash because that's another quick one and we could plant string beans out in the garden but frankly friends i just don't think we can deal with it um we have to we have to cover our string beans immediately because of bean beetles and deer and it's just too much work anyway sorry rabbit hole um remember it's august and i'm a flower farmer and it is really really tiring so I'm helping Bobo. So I went ahead and so I saw that she hadn't finished all the Rudbeckias. Friends, Rudbeckias, there are so many types of Rudbeckias and I grow them all. I think we're up to like 12 different types of Rudbeckias. Um, and they all have a different look, color, need, a little bit later blooming or a little bit earlier or whatever. Um, hardy annual Rudbeckias, um, we're talking about... Um, Rudbeckia herta, that's Rudbeckia, H-I-R-T-A. That is a huge family of Rudbeckias. And this is not the perennial Rudbeckias, which I don't know the botanical name of those off the top of my head. But I know that one of the perennial um, Rudbeckias is Goldstrom, which is really commonly sold in nurseries because it is a perennial. That's not the kind of Rudbeckias we're talking about, friends. These are hardy annuals, which means they typically do not survive a second year. Of after they have bloomed, um, less than 25% literally come back after the first year of, let's just say we plant these this year. They're going to bloom next spring and early summer. If some of those plants were left, they'd look good all summer. The chances of them surviving the next winter to bloom a second time is less than 25%. If you're a home gardener, go for it. But as a commercial cut flower farmer, you can't even think about counting on that. You can't waste space, space that's going to have to be tended to and have a low output, right? So that's what I'm talking about because I always get these questions constantly about, aren't they perennials? Um, the, the herdas do recede. Not all of them recede as strong as others. But as again, as a grower, you can't rely on any of that. You plant them every fall and then again in very early spring to stretch out your bloom. Um, and we have them blooming before Mother's Day, depending on the variety. So I am going to be, which, what am I starting today? Today I am starting 
what became one of my favorites last year, Cherokee Sunset. If y'all saw the Instagram, I think it was on Facebook too, of the bed of Rebecca that had gone over with the netting and I was pulling the netting up. That was Cherokee Sunset right there at the head. That was, I mean, that was one of the most beautiful mixes of flowers I have ever grown. I mean, we had people that walked down our street for years that have never stopped and said, what in the heck is that over there? That Cherokee Sunset did it. This would be an awesome display garden. Um, but anyway, so I'm starting those and I'm also starting another surprise favorite, Cherry Brandy. Rudbeckias, I'm just going to start my work here and I'll tell y'all what I'm doing and show you in a minute here. Um, Rudbeckias are kind of a little slow to germinate sometimes. We sow seeds that we're using our toothpick with in this little aluminum pan. And that's because there's no static electricity. This is a lab pan and it doesn't really matter how tiny your seed is. Um, all right, I'm trying to get the seeds out. I think I got them all. All right. So, moisten toothpick. And typically, I spit in the corner of my tray. But I'll do a lot of things on YouTube, but I'm not spitting y'all because I'll hear about it. All right, so I what are we going to do here? So, these are the soil blocks, which I've already made. And this is our wonderful tray, which we still have these in stock, friends. These come from England, and we have the worst time getting them. Um, but I bought two huge pallets worth, thousands and thousands of them. Um, and this holds 100 of the small blocks, which is really the perfect number of any individual variety that I want to start nowadays. Um, so it works out really, really well. So I'm going to sit this right here. This could be dangerous, y'all. So I'm sitting it on the keyboard. You still can't see it. No. Nope. I don't want to do that. All right, I'm doing something different. So I'm going to put this down here. Take you off this little stand. There we go. All right. So I have my seeds here, little teeny seeds. And when you have um, saliva moistened on your toothpick and those seeds are sitting here in a non-static electricity container. This goes so quick. Now, Rudbeckia seeds, as most many seeds, are just firmly seeded on the surface. Rudbeckia actually can go either way. You can push them down a little bit more if that makes you feel better. Um, but I'm just literally making sure that they're making good contact. And as you can see, they just come right off the toothpick and this really goes really, really quick. And it is a combination of no static electricity and sticky saliva. And I just keep going. And for me personally, I always have a little pattern I go meaning like the way I go up and down, like right now. So that, that seed packet must have already been open before. That wasn't enough seeds. Anyway, see how I stick my toothpick where I stop? Because you can't really see where you've sewn. And so I always go in a zigzag up and down motion. Oh, you know what I haven't done, y'all? Holy cow, I'm getting off sidetracked. I did not put our name on here. We got to ID this. Bobo would kill me. All right. Wait a minute, y'all. Let's do this. Where's the beginning of the tape? Tape makes me crazy, y'all, because I can't quite. Oh, there it is. All right. So this is Rudbeckia Cherokee Sunset. And the date, of course, and we already looked, it's 8 12. Yeah, um, can't tell you how bad that would have been if I had not. I kind of wrote that big. So we write it on masking tape and then stick it to our trays. And believe it or not, it holds up like a gem on there. All right, back to what we're doing. Need more seeds. Yeah, this is a lot more seeds. All right, back 
to the story. And so when you're doing this, if your seeds aren't picking up, that means you need more saliva. That's the problem with not spitting in the tray. We'll see what I'm going to do here when that happens. So Rudbeckia's hertas, which is, as I mentioned, there's just so many different varieties, are winter hardy to zone five. That means that if you live in zone five, six, seven, eight, or nine, you definitely need to plant these fellas. Sometimes I'd plant the same one twice, y'all, because I'm talking, I lose track. Um, you definitely need to fall plant. What fall planting does, the whole benefit, the whole cool flower concept is that these are cool season hardy annuals. They can survive many winters. And when that means that they can survive winter, that means that they can get the added benefit of getting well established all winter long instead of you planting it in spring and it have to jump into action at the same. Yep, y'all got that doesn't didn't want to pick up. Um, so it gets to be well established. And when that happens, so the bottom line rule is this. If something is winter hardy in your zone, friends, you have got to fall plant it. That plant will bloom earlier. It will bloom longer into the and face the heat and humidity so much longer. And it will be more disease and pest resistant because it is so very um, well established. You will get twice as many stems. I feel pretty confident saying that. And they will be so much taller. You just won't even believe it. You know, I back when um, Sahara, which is one of the really gorgeous Rudbeckias, was becoming popular two or three years ago, I didn't start it out of the gate. I didn't jump on the bandwagon at first because the main complaint that I heard people talking about was how short it was. And I'm thinking, you know, when we were in high production, if there was one thing that I did not tolerate is a short flower. When you're cutting 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week. Y'all, I just about lost track where I was. I may have. Um, when you're cutting that many flowers every week, you do not want any flowers that are short that you have to bend over even deeper and struggle to get harvested. And then for it to not maybe be tall enough to get a premium price for it, right? So that's what held me back. But let me tell you something. So we plant Sahara following the cool flower concept and those suckers are 36 inches tall. Easy. I think I'm going to need more than that. Um, so it's just living proof. And you know that if you listen to the um, podcast that came out this morning, the Cool Flower Seed Talk with me and Lane, um, she shares a little experiment that happened for her because the um, she lives in deer country like big time. And she had planted a bunch of snaps in the fall. Um, and the deer kind of decimated the patch. Some of them survived, but not all of them through the winter. So in the very early spring, she supplemented those snaps and started more and planted them amongst the fall planted one. She said it was night and day difference. That was just such a really great analogy to learn about. Um, so you can see that I'm just firmly seeding the seed on the surface. If you don't know about soil blocking, um, you can learn a lot more about it. Nope, that didn't stick. You can learn about it on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com. There, under the resources, there's a whole category called All Things Soil Blocking, which is just, I mean, it's got blogs, videos. Um, it highlights the stuff on the store. We sell the equipment. We still um, import that from England. That's where the blockers are made. That's where they were 
Um, this method was actually something that the Dutch did. And then an Englishman many decades ago saw what they were doing. And he's the one that engineered the tool, which is called the soil blocker. And um, it's pretty cool. So we grow in this block. This Rudbeckia will not be potted up. It will grow in this block until it goes to the garden. And it's just super efficient, quick, and easy because this is the most labor intensive part of it. And I'll tell you that I'd be doing this a lot faster if I wasn't talking to you guys. So y'all, wait a minute. I need four more seeds if I don't drop them on the floor. Um, and then it's just basically caring for them with, you know, moisture and weekly fertilizer and giving them the grow lights and keeping them alive and happy and growing until it's time to plant them outside. So that is that for that one. All right, let's put these back. So literally that is all that is involved. So let's throw those away. Um, and now these will go on to seedling heat mat. And once they 50% of them start to sprout, sometimes rude Beckias can be difficult. Um, so sometimes I'll move them off the heat mat before that happens. So I'll put these on the heat mat and I literally lay, Tucker is trying to eat the sunflower seeds out of the tray. Tuck, Tuck, don't do that boy. Um, so we'll put them on the seedling heat mat and then I lay wide weave burlap on top of the blocks. That just helps to trap moisture. Um, I've never been a believer of domes and saran or plastics on top of it because I learned that from Elliot Coleman, that that is like a beautiful breeding ground for disease, like dampening off um, to actually grow there. You have to really monitor it closely and it works for some people, but they obviously are better monitors than I am. But friends, because I'll tell you this, the way it works for me is I go in my grow room once a day in the morning. See, he's looking for something, y'all. Um, say hi to all of our friends, buddy. Um, and so I go in in the morning, I water, I take care of anybody, I move them around if they need to be moved, and they don't see me again till the next morning. That's why I have never used that method. So this tray will go onto the ceiling heat mat, I'll lay burlap on it every morning, I pull the burlap back, water accordingly, and once that sprouting happens, I move them from the heat, take the burlap off, move them from the heat, and put them under grow lights. Um, and then they'll get moved outdoors. Um, I believe everybody's happier outdoors growing. It's just better air, oxygen, right? Um, so I will do that once they get enough size on them that I feel like they'll do okay out there. All right, the other one we're going to start is Cherry Brandy, and it's another Rudbeckia, Rudbeckia herda. And this is cherry brandy. I always say it backwards. Y'all know I am severely dyslexic and it makes me crazy. So this is August 13th. I had to think about that. All right. And this is a rude Becky. Yeah. All right. So love the pen. It holds up under um, moisture and UV rays. I mean, that's what it was basically created for. If you use a Sharpie, holy cow, you'll come out one day and all of a sudden all your writing is gone. It'll make you crazy. That wasn't. All right. Buck Tucker's back to eating gum, Frina. All right. So we're going to put this on. All right, and y'all, I don't know what I'm going to do this afternoon, so I'll be posting a reel probably tomorrow morning. We had um, a monsoon rain here. We got like three and a half inches in two hours on Wednesday evening, late afternoon, and I'm pretty grateful because um, we had a huge photo shoot on Wednesday. I mean, we had like 45 buckets of flowers, but there was a lot of shooting done in the garden. And like all of that gardens got pretty much flattened. Um, not all of it. The part that was netted, this is the joy of netting your flowers, y'all. Those that had netting gave us options. Um, and so, but some of them, even because the rain was so torrential, the stakes gave way. 
and I had to go shore it up this morning. So I did some videos of me um, doing that. So at least you have options with when you have netting. All right. So I am just, this again is another Rebecca Herta. It is Cherry Brandy. Or is it Brandy Cherry? Cherry Brandy. See y'all, I can't remember from one minute to the next. And I was really surprised over these because I really heard, I mean, the seed hybridizers even say 20 to 25 inches. Oh, we got 30 to 36 inches easily on all of these. And why is that? because we fall planted them. Um, I would love for folks in zone four. Um, the problem with people when you start getting, we have a lot of people doing cool flowers in zone four and zone three, and they aren't fall planting. They're, fall, they're planting in very early spring because they have such, I mean, they get ridiculously cold temperatures, but they also have heavy snow load. Um, but we have two growers that really do a lot of experimenting and I mean, I'm just surprised at some of the results that they're getting. So you have to know that very early spring planting is the real benefit for folks that are in those really cold northern regions that in addition to that, they get heavy snow load, which means there's no sun. Um, so there's a lot of variables that can happen. Cool flowers are for everybody. It's just that we all perhaps... Um, plant at different timing, right? So I'm going to empty a couple of these packages. These have fewer. You know what dictates how many seeds are in a packet, y'all? It's how much the seed cost. I mean, that's the only way that we can really dictate that, right? And Or, you know, do what we have to do. And when your seeds are expensive, I'm going to do one more because we have a hundred blocks here. Um, anyway, you have to really know your zone, know your frost dates, and then learn the hardiness zone of those flowers that you want to plant. And friends, if you plant plants that are not hardy in your zone, you have to know that's called a gamble. That's called a risk. That's called you have to take extra steps to get those plants to survive. Um, so we all have to do our homework. Um, nobody can do that for you. And it's hard lessons learned, but people have to learn them. I mean, our, our boxes are stacked with people having failures because, and the failures are totally self-induced just like I did. But friends, here's the secret. The road to success is paved with failures if you go about it and learn from your mistakes. I make mistakes all the blooming time. Just ask my staff. Sometimes we do things and then we look at each other and say, well, this is not going to work. And we just spent a lot of money on that. But you know what? That is the way it goes. Um, and that's why, um, you know, we are preparing for um, Flower Farm. My course, Flower Farm in School, the Basics, enrollment is in October. So we're doing a ton of work on that right now, which just means the girls are having me review things, look at things, talk about things. And I'm this morning I had to sit down and they call them. Lisa's love letters. They're the notes and reviews that, um, and actually our Jesse deemed it that name. Um, letters that people send to us and emails and reviews of just how the course has helped them and what it's done for them. And, you know, the people that I see that consistently make it to the other side. And what I, what I mean by that is that they say, I want to be a flower farmer. I want to start a business. I don't mean, it doesn't have to be a full-fledged take your life over business. It's like a side hustle that they want to generate some income for their family. 
but they understand the importance. I got two on that one, y'all. Whoop. Let me get him. Got him. Um, they understand the significance of doing it in a way that they can make it to the other side and be successful. Um, and reading, I had to read through some of those love letters, love notes this morning. Um, and the people that really seem to excel and exceed and succeed. Oh, look, y'all. Do y'all see this right here? We have our very own caterpillar. So I made these soil blocks outside in an open tub that's been sitting out there. And I'm sure he kind of got airlifted in. I'll put him right here. Oh, I'm not going to put him on the tray. He's going to be on the computer here where there's nothing he can really damage. Um, these are the guys that eat your seedlings to the ground, by the way, y'all. Now I've totally forgotten where I am, I think. I think we're going to start right here. Um, anyway, those folks that just really make it to the other side, whether you're trying to be a flower farmer or a gardener, are the people that put in the work before they start doing the work. And what I mean by that is that they figure out what needs to be done and don't just jump in heads first. And there's nothing wrong with that because heavens knows I've done that. But anyway, shouldn't be talking about this. I'm just rambling, right? All right, let's see if I may not have brought enough seeds home, y'all. And I double sowed, I am pretty sure, some of these. But all I'm saying is I personally review stuff. See, I picked up too many on that one. I review things before I go to do them. And I mean, nobody can remember everything. And sometimes you can eyeball it, but not always. Like eyeballing, this is a big one. Does the seed need to be covered with soil or not? Do you know that every year when I go outside in the fall to direct seed some cool flowers, which is the only time of the year that I direct seed, um, I take the book with me. And so I am sure to know which ones get covered with soil and which ones don't. Because if you do it backwards, Guess what, friends? They are not going to. Um, are y'all watching this little caterpillar? He's making his way back over here. I'm not going to let him get on, though. Um, that would prevent them from germinating, perhaps. You know, the one that is so very difficult for people is poppies and bells of Ireland. Y'all, believe it or not, it looks like I'm going to have exactly enough seeds. All right. Where'd that little booger go? All right, y'all, where'd he go? Is he on the side of my tray? I'm just getting the tray away from him. All right, folks. So that was sewing Rudbeckia. And it's a surface sewer. And so these guys are going to go onto the seedling heat mat in the room. And so the cool flower grow room is this. Um, Cool flower, air temperature for that grow room. My target is 65 to 68 degrees. They're on a seedling heat mat, which means the soil is warm, the air is cool. And so I also, when we start doing cool season hardy annuals, I put cookie cooling racks. Yes, folks, the racks that you put cookies on when you bring them out, they have legs on them about this tall. I put those on the heat mat just to smidgen, tight, cool it down just a little bit. And then I put my trays on that. They need consistent warmth. They just don't need hot consistency. And I have found that little recipe of cookie cooling racks on the heat mat 
Um, for the trays, air temp, 65 to 68 degrees, and they do fabulous. All right, let me clear my stuff here, and then I'm going to start looking at these questions. No, oh, I make such a blooming mess, right? All right, let me get my little... I really don't want to drop one of these trays, and I really don't want to cut y'all off. Stand by, y'all. All right, here we go. Um, so that's what how the grow room is for cool season hardy annuals. And you have to find what the conditions are for what you have, meaning what your setup is for warm season and cool season. We find that you can't start them both at the same time because they have really different desires. Um, and that's the bottom line of having great seed starting. You have to, it's not about you guys. It's about what the seed, what is, what does the seed need to germinate best? And that's what we really try to, to provide you with that information. Um, so let me go back here to the top and hello, everybody. And Anne says, oh, this is so true. And happy, not humid Saturday. So I'm in Southeastern Virginia. We have had scorchers. Um, that violent storm that came through here Wednesday that wiped out our garden so much um, was a cold front meeting the, 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 the 99 humidity degrees, you know, them fighting it out. And um, so it's cool. It was 70 degrees. I actually put a jacket on to walk the dog this morning. Um, and we still have some heat coming, but it is a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, and so I love seeing the sunflower emoji. And so everybody knows what that is. Whenever you see people commenting with the sunflower emoji, those are students of any of our online courses. We love it when our students identify themselves. And because, you know, I will start, you're going to hear me start saying, my students, if you would be willing to raise your hand on any live event and say, hey, I'm one of Leeson's students. If you're thinking about taking her course, just ask me anything. We want people to know firsthand from our student experience what our courses are like. Um, and so we love when people identify themselves um, with us. And so Fran says she's exhausted. I mean, that is the reality for flower farmers. Um, and I mean, even if you're doing everything right, meaning you're keeping on top of everything, it's just the heat exhaustion and the height of if you're growing a lot of warm season tender annuals, oh my gosh, they will take you down at this time of the year. You wouldn't believe them. The, I, I don't know if I, I guess I did post some images. Um, if you go into the app, you can watch the replays of the shop and show. You would not believe how many flowers were here. And we actually attempted to do a behind the scenes, which there's one on um, YouTube and Instagram. I don't know how much you could see of it, but there was a ton of flowers. And that's what kills farmers in August. So the way that I recommend um, some self-care stuff that's reality, um, people can talk about self-care all they want about taking time off, doing this, that, and the other. That has just never been a reality for me. Um, but I'll tell you what is a reality. And I, this is one of the things I do talk about at Flower Farming School. One of the things that I recommend that my students do during the month of January or whenever, I mean, we have a lot of Australian students that are opposite of us. When your downtime is, meaning in the deep of winter, I recommend taking a week and filling your freezer with harvest meals. These are meals that are quick and easy that when you drag your tail in at eight o'clock on an, on a, um, you know, August night and everybody's staring at you like, I mean, I have a man that'll cook dinner, um, but he also owns a company. So we're kind of on the same wavelength. We're both pretty tired at the end of the day. Um, you want to have some easy go to meals that you can literally pull out of the freezer and have ready in 30 minutes or 45 minutes. And in the dead of winter is when you do those things and don't let yourself use those up earlier in the year. I mean, if you have to have a, you know, my freezer to have boxes, plastic boxes that I put 
you know, bag spaghetti in, a stack of ribeye steaks, um, you know, whatever the things are, little lasagnas um, that we can take out and literally pop into the oven, almost frozen. Um, and the ribeyes, I'll, this is totally off subject, y'all, but I'm going to tell you anyway. This is the way I defrost steaks and ground beef super fast. We do not use microwave um, and we do it so quickly. It's not a risk. I've been told by the health people, health department type people. So we have our ground beef. We get it from our cousin, Glendore Farms. They ship all over the country, by the way. Best beef ever. Tastiest meat you will ever eat. They package our ground beef in flat packages. They're about five inches square and about an inch deep. Very much the same as like a ribeye steak or any of the steaks. They're flat. If you take metal pans, metal 13 by 9 bacon pans, two of them, put one upside down on your counter, upside down, then put your meat on it, then put the other pan right side up on top of the meat, then put a five pound bag, if you can find a five pound bag, I think it's four and a half pounds now of sugar on top of it or flour, something heavy, y'all. In about 20 minutes, that metal pan pulls all the cold frozenness out of that meat and it's ready to prepare like you took it out, like a good girl, like you're supposed to two days before. <laughs> um, anyway, having August meals, I think you should have three meals for every week in August. Um, because it will change your life. <laughs> have frozen garlic bread, lasagnas, spaghetti, steaks, or whatever your go-to. There's a lot of chicken casseroles, um, and you just won't believe how that will revive you um, because people, that's the reality. And we do a lot of mowing down in August of things that in July, I convinced myself that we were going to resurrect I just looked at one this morning. Let me just tell you what this one is. So Cosmos, um, which really perform, they do the best production from now until the end of the season. They really like the days as they're getting shorter and shorter, but they definitely bloom earlier. So we succession plant Cosmos three times. Very early, um, not very early spring, spring, I should say, then early summer and then midsummer. And the midsummer has, I mean, they're only like 24 inches tall. They haven't even started to put on the show. The very first planting, I had Christine cut to the ground. I mean, we left like 10 or 12 inch stumps, um, little frillies on there for them to reflush. And the reality hit me this morning when I was walking Tucker around the farm you know what the challenge of that is? Why did I even have her waste the time to do that is what I'm saying out loud to myself is because before those cosmos can regrow, even though they have bio 360 on them, we're going to see, are the weeds going to outgrow the regrowth of the cosmos? They are definitely probably not worth the labor to keep them weeded. Anyway, this is the kind of stuff that happens. So I can almost promise you we will not do that again. We'll just mow them um, and either plant cover crop or plant another fresh crop there. Um, so August is a killer month. And I know you're exhausted, Fran, but think about those things. Um, and I'm sorry, y'all went down a rabbit hole. And I see that Jesse has posted some links on here to the shopping show, um, to the podcast, um, the seed talk with cool flowers. And let's see what Patrice is asking. Good morning, Patrice. For the cool season flowers, the guidelines that you state to plant in the fall is six to eight weeks before first frost. Is the planting date the date after we already have started indoors for three to four weeks just to need to clarify on when to start the seeds and when to transplant? Great question. It's a very common question I hear. So there are some cool flowers that are direct seeded in the garden, and there are some that are planted by transplants. That six to eight week planting date is either seeds in the garden for those that prefer it that way, or for the transplants that, yes, you started weeks prior to. It depends on what flower you're talking about, which way it goes. So on that six to eight week day, you need to either have your transplant ready to plant, or you'll have your seeds ready. They both, the seed and the transplant, need the six to eight weeks to either sprout from that little seed and develop into a baby plant. That would be the direct seed eight weeks. 
that transplant needs those six to eight weeks to get established after you transplanted it. So I hope that clarifies that for you. Hello, everybody. We got people from North Carolina, Kansas, Alaska. Good morning, everybody. And that reminds me, friends, we are now shipping to Alaska and Hawaii. That's a new um, paramount for us um, with tech stuff. So please spread the word. And home gardener here. I grow at a community garden in Virginia Beach and raise beds in my home. This is the first summer starting tro pro cut successions every two weeks. And it's been magical. Friends, I just cannot tell you how it changes your life to learn how to really embrace succession planting. And that's something that my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, kind of helps you to wrap your head around. Um, and I'm working on something that's going to really help people, I hope, even more with that. Because what it does, the succession plantings liberate you from basically suffering so much when something goes wrong with the planting whether it's sunflowers or your general cutting garden, because you know you have another one coming along. It just improves and it changes the way you react and the way you handle and the way that you replant. All right, Lisa, first time uh, started and kept alive seven eucalyptus. They're tiny at 10 leaves. The goal, early spring foliage variety, best care for the winter. Not sure if it'll be worth all the effort. Op opinion, Virginia Zone 7A. Let me tell you something, Lisa. So I definitely think you should try. Um, Dave Dowling was here last year. I think it was during our open farm. Um, and he told me we had some um, silver drop eucalyptus, which the seed has not been available now for two years because of the Australian fires. That's where the seeds come from. Um, and he said, Lisa, you definitely need to try to winter those over. So I did what he told me. I cut them back to about 18 inches tall, not hard, just you're just trying to get their size down before they go into winter, right? And then you want to pile about, you want to mulch normally underneath, like regular bark mulch, not up against the bark, but on the ground, you know, just to really suppress weeds. And then he told me to pile leaves about 12 inches deep all around those plants. That just insulates and blocks. And then I hooped and I double row covered. And those babies survived like a dream. But let me tell you this. So last year I had, because I still had silver drop seeds in my own seed bank, um, I started more and we planted them. And we had like a pack of eight or nine plants and we were so crazy here last year in the fall that I said, I'm just sacrificing them. Let them go. We did nothing. I'm in, But you have to remember, I'm in 7B, 8A. So I'm a little south of you. We did nothing and they survived our winter. So what that says to me is that you should definitely do those steps that Dave told me and try to save your plants. Because here's the thing. It's not just that the seeds aren't available for some of them. It's that they are so much more productive the next year. So go for it. Facebook user, am I correct that you replant yarrow every year? If so, why is that? Excellent question. Because yarrow falls under the same issues that Rudbeckia faces. There are perennial yarrows and there are hardy annual yarrows. And so the hardy annual yarrows, which is... Milliforum, I forget the name. I have to, I would have to see it again to know the bat, the botanical name. Um, the Colorado Sunset is the one that we sell the seed to, and the only one that I grow. They are hardy annuals. They again will reseed just like a Rebecca will. But here's the problem that I've personally experienced with the reseeding of the Colorado Sunset. It's only certain colors that are strong reseeders. And it's not those beautiful pale yellow, the shrimp color, the, the dark magenta pinks. Those aren't the ones that reseed. There is an old picture going around the internet somewhere and it's on our website somewhere that shows I had two 100 foot beds of yarrow. That was back when we were in high production and we allowed it to reseed. So the first year it was like this rainbow behind me. It had all the colors. It was glorious. Then it reseeded and we just, uh, we just netted it the next year and let it grow. It was 99% that white color, none of the beautiful colors. So that is 
why you replant it every year is because you lose them. Um, and while some of the plants may winter over for a second bloom, it is a very low rate. And again, as a grower, you cannot count on any of that. The maintenance of trying to keep those types of plantings weed free is a headache. So that's why. Which variety blooms at Mother's Day of Rebecca? Um, so we make Mother's Day, if it's a warm spring and early, um, Indian summer. That's the big yellow one. And I tell you the ones that are earliest for me, I can almost promise you that Goldilocks would also get Mother's Day. But you have to do all those little extra things that we do to cool flowers here on our farm. We fall plant them, we get them in on time, we plant decent sized little healthy plants, and then they're hooped and row covered potentially for the winter, which means that they get super well established um, and they are growing a little, they're a little ahead of the game. But I will tell you what happens to Rebecca's oftentimes when you hoop them is the slugs will eat them. Um, the underneath hoops is like a club med, y'all. That's like us going to Palm Beach in January, right? It's like everybody wants to go there. Well, the same thing is with pests. They want to come there. So you have to keep an eye on that. Oftentimes our Rebecca's will get eaten under a hoop and row cover during winter by slugs or snails. But the minute we take the hoops off, the covers off, the birds come in and just gobble up the snails and they will regrow. So that's that. All right. Lisa had some seed, mainly Cosmo and Sons germinate upside down. Some germinated through the backside. I felt the three quarter blocks were too small, fiddled with them way too much. Your seed starting to experience any of this. Well, first off, um, sunflowers don't go in small soil blocks. They either would go in a large block or in um, a plug tray and you cover them with soil. It ends up being about a half an inch of soil the way that I plant sunflower seeds. Um, in Cosmos, maybe you didn't push them in deep enough. I mean, we put them in pointy in first and they literally almost all that's sticking out is a little bit of the tail. And that can happen. Sometimes there's also... Um, there's a name for it, which I'm trying to think, and I can't think of the name. I have seen it, but not all. I mean, you'll have one do it here or there, but not very often. So that's what I would be sure that you're pushing it down deep enough. So Patty asks, oh, wait, where'd you go, Patty? There you are. When are sunflowers ready to transplant? In our experience, it's between the two to three weeks. You don't want them to go past three weeks. They just don't perform as well. They get stressed after three weeks and then they can fall victim to disease in the garden, all kinds of problems. Um, so as soon as you can pull on the stem and the entire cell comes up easily without you feeling like you're going to rip the stem from the roots, that's when we do it. And for us, that's about two and a half to three weeks. All right. I'm trying to see. I'm going to do one more question. I don't know what this is. Let's see, Lisa. How much saving does TGW Seed Starter do? I knew when I was spending so much time saving tiny, tiny sprouts at some point, speeding past good business practice, beginner recovering gardener. So um, I'm not sure I understand your question, Lisa. I'm sorry. I knew I was speaking. So I think what you're saying is if you have puny starts for whatever reason, you're spending time doing CPR on them. No, we don't do that at all. Um, unless it's something we don't have very much of or it's a seed that's not available or we can't restart it or something like that. Um, and so, yes, you're right. It's hard to let things go. Y'all would just croak if you saw the stuff that I composted. I mean, you just learn through years of experience. You're better off to spend your time starting more than you are to spend time trying to do CPR. All right. I want to answer this one too. I, this is the last one. This is Lori. I'm in zone 5B and I'm currently planning out my ninth succession of sunflowers. Way to go for the Midwest old threshing reunion coming up and a late August wedding. There is so... They are such a joy to constantly have to be able to harvest. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's not, I didn't see the rest of your question there. I thought you were asking um, something. Yeah, once you, I'm telling you, friends, this is why I'm a flower farmer. Once you figure out this whole succession 
and how you should constantly um, replant a lot of things. It just makes it so much more joyful. And I'm going to tell you this and then I'm going to end it with this. Um, so, you know, we're in a really different place right now because we're not selling flowers anymore. We grow this big cutting garden for education purposes. Like I wouldn't be doing this if we were still selling flowers. I wouldn't be here with you right now. But I'll tell you, one of the things that I have found that is happening that I totally understand now why people that don't harvest on a regular basis, flowers and their vegetables and their fruits, um, why they have problems. So because we don't have to harvest every Monday and Thursday for our customers, we harvest just once a week for our big shopping show on Fridays, right? Um, and what I'm finding is that you, we have a lot of problems because of that. I mean, there's old flowers in the garden because it's only being cut once a week. And the other thing that I just, we have a lot of fig trees on this farm and we used to sell the heck out of our figs to our members only mom, um, flower mart members. And so we have not been harvesting our figs like we normally do. I mean, you can only eat so many figs, right? Um, I mean, we love them. I eat pizza, put them on pizza. We put them on everything. But when you're not picking them clean twice a week and picking them early like you're supposed to, that means the wasps are getting in there and the bees, which makes it harder when we go in to pick those that we want. So friends, when you... That's why I totally recommend if you're a home gardener, you need to have a very small garden and pick it hard and pick it twice a week because you will have a better success rate. Um, and small growers, you're over planting most often, which creates this vicious cycle of failure. Um, so I'm glad it's been good for you, Lori. And friends, I have to get off here now. I have a bunch of men out there I'm going to get lunch for. Um, for the construction going on here on our farm. And I want to just recommend again, remember we have an app, go to your app store, download, or you can just find all of that information at thegardenersworkshop.com. And Jesse has actually posted a lot of the things that I've mentioned right here in the feed um, on YouTube. And um, check that out. I would love for you to join me on Fridays. We have some great giveaways, friends. We have learned that just brings swarms of people. We're giving away stuff you can't buy. Um, and so it's a lot of fun. Um, check out the Gardener's Workshop. And friends, when it does come time that you need tools, seeds, and supplies, or you need some education, consider us. Those avenues of our business, our online garden shop and our courses are what fund all of this free resources that we provide to you guys. We have a staff of 14 people and everybody has to get a paycheck just like you do and everything else that goes with it. And we love that we are able to provide so many resources and to support people in the way that we can. And we just thank you for considering us when the time comes that you have a dollar to spend and need something that was related. And so friends, until we meet again, ciao.